hello everybody, it's Joey from Luke's. We have a uh, very nice wine tasting tonight, virtual tasting with Italian wine expert, Ciro Perone. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. Thank you, Joey, how are you? Excellent, outstanding. So, um, so yeah, so you're, be, you're gonna be tasting some Chiarlo wines, right? Yeah, yeah, so, well, thank you. Thank you for you guys who joined in and uh, thank you, Joey and Taj from Luke's for having me. So, um, as Joey mentioned, my name is uh, Ciro Pirone. I work for Horizon Beverage, which is a wholesaler here in New England, and I'm responsible for the Italian portfolio. And tonight, we wanted to discover a couple of uh, fun wines, specifically Italian wines, and more specifically than that, like uh, wines from Piemonte. So, here and there, as we get along, I'm going to share a couple of images. I don't know if anybody here has been to Piemonte, but in case you have not, at least hopefully I'll give you a better understanding by seeing some images, places, I'll do a couple of pictures. So anyway, I want to um, start by sharing this uh, image of Piemonte because I think really this image speaks for the region itself. So Piemonte, it's a really, it's a beautiful region shaped in the northwestern part of Italy, shaped by the mountains. As a matter of fact, you can see in the background of this hilltop village right here in front of the image, you see the Italian Alps in all its beauty and majesty, right? And uh, Piemonte also historically is a very important region for Italy because it uh, was really the springboard of Italian unification, which took place in 1861, because prior to that, I figured that since the basically the fifth century AD until 1861, Italy was like uh, a mess, right? It was a bunch of different city states, kingdoms, duchies, all sorts of different people that colonized the various territories and they were always at war with each other. So that kind of made things a bit complicated until finally Italians decided to unify the country. And, and as I mentioned, it all started from Piemonte with the, a gentleman whose name was Camillo Benso, Count of Cavour. And uh, this gentleman basically you know, started the process of unification starting with basically Sicily and then eventually conquering the rest of Italy, moving north and finally Italy, as I mentioned, in 1861 was unified. So very, very important region for historical purposes, but also is a very important region for land mass because it's one of the largest regions of Italy, very important for the production of wine. Um, Oggi Piemonte is one of those regions that very focused on high quality wines. It, if you had to compare Piedmont to another region, another wine region of the world, you would definitely compare Piedmont to Burgundy uh, for various reasons, most specifically, you know, climatic conditions, but also because the wines, for the most part, they tend to be wines based on, a, you know, 100% varietal. So they're pure wines, for the most part, anyway, made with one varietal rather than blending, which, as you know, is more common in Tuscany. And that would be the same case if you were to compare with Bordeaux in France, right? So Piemonte is a really, really special place. And uh, the name itself of the region comes from uh, Piede and Monte, two Italian words that basically mean at the foot of the mountain. Because the region itself, as I mentioned, it's shaped by the Italian Alps with the high peak called Monte Bianco or the White Mountain. And eventually, you know, on the southern part, we find all the hilly you know, in the area of Piemonte, which is where most of the wines come from. As a matter of fact, I'll show you right now what the um, kind of um, topographical map, not to be too technical, but at least you get an idea. So as I mentioned, we are in the northwestern part of the country. As you can see on the outskirts, the, you know, Piemonte practically, it's almost like created by as three different belts of land mass. The outer belt, which are the mountains, which accounts for 43%. And it's right here that practically separates Piemonte to the north with Switzerland. Right here, this is the tiny region of Valle d'Aosta. And to the west, separates Piemonte from, uh, from the country of France, right? So it's Piemonte. Then the inner belt, it's where we find all the hills. And this is the area where we find the, the main uh, wines produced. Might as well be Alto Piemonte, or the upper northern part of the country, where we find the Lago Maggiore, you know, the, one of the largest lakes uh, in Italy, and where we find very famous wines like Gemme, Gattinara, Lessona, these beautiful expressions of Nebbiolo from the north. And then in the south, instead, we find uh, 
the major important area for production of quality wines of Piemonte that everybody is familiar with called Lange. And practically the Lange is the territory where, we, where you know, famous Barolo, Barbaresco, Barbera d'Alba, the many Dolcettos and things like that come from. At the same time, also along basically the Ligurian Apennines, because practically these are the Alps and these are the Maritime Alps, so the Alps are close to the sea, and eventually they connect the Italian Apennine Mountains. So the Apennine is this chain of mountains that runs from Apia all the way into Sicily. And literally this little tip right here in the southernmost part of Piemonte, uh, going into Liguria, it's the area of Gavi, which we'll discuss and discover tonight. Now, other than some of the you know, features of the land are important to understand, that Piemonte, it's also a region where the climatic conditions tend to be continental. Now, that changes depending on what part of the region you're in. Logically, in the north, it's more continental, meaning you're gonna have extreme you know, cold winters and the fairly hot summers as well. In the south, it's definitely still decently continental, but definitely more affected by the vicinity of the so-called Ligurian Sea that kind of brings in a little bit more mitigation of conditions. And that is why, actually, in southern Piemonte, specifically in the area of Lange and all these territories down here, the wines are 100% varietal because due to the climatic conditions, the grapes can actually fully ripen. Versus when you look at the north, which is definitely more harsher conditions due to the vicinity of the mountains and cooler conditions overall, Traditionally, the wines were always a blend. Now, with minimal quantity of other grapes, but you know, the Nebbiolo of the North were always blended in with five or ten percent of other local grapes. So, hopefully, this kind of gives you a little bit of an understanding of the region overall. If you haven't never been to Piemonte and what it's all about, and as a, specifically, we dig into the specific territories and the two wines that we're going to be discussing about tonight. Now. One way to understand Piemonte and also the culture of Piemonte, because you have, you have to understand if you haven't been to Italy, it's, it's, it's hard to grasp because Italy is a very small country. It's only three quarters the size of California. So when you compare it to the United States, it's a very, very tiny country relatively to, as I mentioned, the United States because it's small, although at the same time, it's the largest producer of wine in the world. So that tells you also how entrenched viticulture and really the culture of drinking wine as well is uh, for, for Italians. At the same time, we have 20 regions, right? You know, the regions of Piemonte, Toscana, Sicilia, Campania, and the many others. And each one of these regions, truthfully, it's almost a country on its own, because as I mentioned, until 1861, so 159 years ago, these regions were separated. So the cultures are very different. In some cases, like up here in the Northwest, they were affected by the French, very long French influence. If you go in Sicily, largely they went through many different, uh, you know, colonization periods and were affected by many cultures, as all the Spanish, the Arabs, going back to the, 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 uh, the Greeks and whatnot. In central part of Italy, the Etruscans, so really shaped the country to be something very unique, region to region. And so it is true for the feature of the people, the language, although Italian is a national language, but we speak different dialects. So it's true for the foods we eat, the habits and traditions, and same is true for wines. One way to understand if you are a welcome guest at a house of the Piedmontese would be that basically you go in, they offer you a nice glass of wine because they have to uh, be a guest, but if they do give you a glass of dolcetto, that means they really don't care for you too much as a guest, but they have to be nice and they give you a glass of dolcetto. If you are a welcome guest, considered to be a friend, they will give you a nice glass of Barbera, but ultimately you will never get a glass of Nebbiolo because Nebbiolo was always considered to be the most important grape, making the best wines, and also the wines consumed by the family for very special occasions. So fortunately tonight, we're not talking about Dolcetto, so everybody's welcome and we love everybody, right? So uh, now the, the family specifically that we're talking about tonight, or the producer, it's called Michele Chiarlo. So Michele Chiarlo, I'll show you a label, one of the two labels of the wines where at least I'll be tasting on my end on this side. Michele Chiarlo is a producer that has been around since uh, 1956. So practically 54, uh, no, 64 years now. Um, it's a family. Uh, Michele Chiarlo is still alive, he's in the 80s. And then his two sons, Alberto and Stefano, they take care specifically of the marketing and PR and Stefano is the winemaker. So Michele Chiarlo has been always considered to be one of the uh, 
producers or one of the pioneers, more specifically for Barbera, in the sense that uh, when you look at the portfolio of wines produced by Michele Chiarlo, you're gonna find the Gavi for white wines, you're gonna find the beautiful Moscato d'Asti, you're gonna find uh, obviously all the great Barolos, Barbaresco, single vineyard Barolos, Dolcetto, and many other things. But at the same time, Barbera is where the family really you know, put their major effort. And as a matter of fact, thanks to them, Barbera and some other families, other families obviously of Piemonte, Barbera was elevated to become and to be considered over the years not only a workhorse grape that can give you a lot of fruit and make it very enjoyable wines, even at its simplest level, but also today we find some fantastic and terrific expressions of Barbera no, known as Nizza from the place of origin where these Barberas come from. And that is thanks to, you know, Roger the Chiarlo family together with some other families that worked very closely to, you know, understand better Barbera and eventually elevate it to the next level, right? So uh, now I'm going to talk about the first wine specifically, uh, which is Gavi. I don't know if you ever had the, the opportunity, mm, please feel free to chip in if you have any questions or there's a, a chat box on the bottom where you can ask a question if you want to but um, I'm just going to show you a quick map that uh, it's again still Piemonte but specifically this map shows you some of the main appellations so Piemonte is a region that does not have any IGT appellations you might be familiar with the Italian governmental tags you know these tags you see on the back of the bottle sometimes wrapped around the neck in this case says Barbera d'Asti DOCG so basically the DOCG implies that these are some of the uh, most historical wines of Italy, the most strictly regulated wines of Italy as far as regulations for, you know, where the vineyards are located, what's the minimum amount of alcohol, what is basically the aging requirement for the specific wine, what's the yield. So there's a, there's a series of regulations. And Piemonte is actually the region that has the most amount of DOCG, which means you really focus their attention on quality. So no IGT wines all whatsoever. So these are some of the main ones. You might be familiar um, with some, like uh, as I mentioned, Barolo, Barbaresco, um, you know, maybe Roero and things of that nature. But specifically, the one we're gonna be talking about first is this one right here. It says Gavi DOCG, which is this pink area, right? So now we're talking about Gavi, specifically Gavi, and I'll show you the label of the wine that I actually am tasting. Hopefully you have the opportunity. If not tonight, please, I suggest grab a bottle. This wine is terrific. Made by Michele Chiarlo. This is a Gavi. Um, so now when we say Gavi, we're talking about one specific grape known as Cortese. Because, uh, you know, in Italy, and that's true for the rest of Europe, honestly, the wines are named after the place of origin, meaning that uh, just as much as Barolo is a village, Montalcino in Tuscany is a village. In this case, specifically, Gavi is the name of a village, it's not the name of a grape. So, practically, the territory of the village of Gavi itself, plus another 10 small communes nearby Gavi, they are the territory where you can grow the Cortese grapes and make a wine known as Gavi. So, that's how it works, right? But as I mentioned, the grape is called Cortese. Cortese is a grape that's been around for a very long time in its territories and went through, throughout history, went through many phases. For example, during the 60s and 70s, wines made out of Cortese, the, the Gavis of the past, were very popular wines because they were wines that everybody enjoyed, were famous. This was way before any Pinot Grigio, way before many other things that today are popular. These wines were around, right? And they were widely exported in other countries. And eventually, because of the overproduction because as a wine, the wines became famous and popular, everybody wanted a piece of the action, so they started playing more Cortese, and eventually the wines turned out to be a lot more diluted, neutral, and almost like flavorless. And unfortunately, it was a down phase for the Cortese grapes, but then again, towards the 80s, and then eventually even more so in the 90s, a lot of great producers, young producers, the newer generation, they decided to really put a lot of effort into making, you know, better Gabi, reducing the yield, planting Cortese in the ideal soils, because then again, the territory is composed of 11 communes. It doesn't mean that in every single corner of the territory of Gavi, you can plant Cortese, it's gonna give you something of magic, right? But there are specific areas, specifically where the soils are composed of calcareous marls. As a matter of fact, this wine itself, now I don't know if you can see from the screen, but right here on the bottom says Le Marne. That's the name of the wine. Le Marne in Italian means the marls. 
Basically, these are the calcareous marls. They're composed of limestone and clay. These are soils that were, you know, uh, they are of marine origin. They were once upon a time at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, and eventually they got pushed up by tectonic plates movement. So these soils are very friable soils. They're very rich in fossils, marine, um, you know, life. The now is dead life, if you will. But anyway, these very white chalky type of soils, they give wines of great freshness, great brightness on the palate. Typically, anyway, wines based on Cortese. Cortese is a grape that has a very high acidity. So it gives you wines that are fantastic as an aperitif. For us Italian, understandably, probably the most important moment of the day is the aperitivo time, meaning the time when you gather at the end of the work day, you gather in this square of it, might as well be a town, a village, a city, and anyway, you gather with friends and family, uh, and you have a nice uh, aperitivo, a nice glass, might as well be a glass of Gavi if you're in the area, might as well be a glass of Prosecco, or maybe an Aperol Spritz, right? That is so popular these days. But Gavi can be exactly that, can be that beautiful, enjoyable, simple glass of wine to enjoy at any moment, but also can be a lot more than that, meaning can be a more structured, flavorful, complex wine, and in some cases, actually quite age-worthy as well. It's all dependent upon producers, and it's all dependent upon also the area where the wine specifically comes from. So anyway, this is an example of Gavi. I look at the color, it's got this beautiful straw, you know, color. It is very vibrant. This is 2018, so the wine is still very youthful. Now, these vineyards are located partially within the town of Gavi and partially outside, still within the, the overall territory of the Appalachian. But take a sniff. Immediately, when you put the nose in the glass, now 2018, you got to keep in mind also vintage. It's a vintage variation, but anyway, 2018 was a fairly warm vintage you need overall. So largely you're going to get a bit more concentration, a bit more slightly more ripening of aromas on the nose. But anyway, in this specific instance, there's plenty of this uh, like yellow apple, but then there's also beautiful yellow plum. So there's plenty of this yellow pulpy type of fruit, maybe slight element of peach, but also, you know, a slight floral note, maybe a little bit of chamomile, almost like chamomile tea bag when you smell it, you know, very intense, very perfumey, but very pleasant. And on the path, the wine is a, take a sip, right? Immediately, it's got this beautiful, um, beautiful, almost like vibration on the sides of the gums. That's the acidity. And Gavi has plenty of that. But at the same time, it's not one of those wines that is extremely acidic, might as well be a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc or something that seems like it's almost like a squeeze of lemon. This is a wine that actually has nice refreshing acidity, but it also has a meat palate richness and complexity. So it's a wine that lasts on the palate for you know, very good amount of time. And one of the reasons for that is that the wine, you know, after the grapes are harvested, they're crushed and fermented, then eventually the wine, before it can be embottled, actually sits on the lees, which is basically the spent yeast cells. And that gives a little bit more texture to the wine. It gives a little bit more, you know, element of a richness, a little bit more mouthfeel, a little bit more density on the palate, almost a slight oiliness, if you will. So it really makes it a fantastic glass of wine. And especially, again, a glass of wine like this, I would definitely suggest to enjoy with some food and specifically maybe some beautiful dishes of seafood. Again, being in New England, maybe oysters, shellfish, if you find octopus and calamari salad somewhere, I think really speaks of the summertime fantastically. But then again, Gavi, this is the last thing I'm going to say about this wine, I promise. Um, also, you got to keep in mind, because we are in the southernmost tip of uh, Piemonte, basically this spills over into the Apennine Mountains of Liguria, you can think also of some of the classic dishes of Liguria, right, which is the southern region um, next to Piemonte, where you find not only lots of seafood uh, cuisine and preparations, but also beautiful dishes such as pesto, right? So this very herbal, refreshing, you know, sauce, it's maybe pasta, and, uh, you know, that fresh basil quality really, I think, could match very, very well with a nice glass of gavi. So, very beautiful. Now, um, let me just show you a picture of uh, what, oh, by, by the way, this is the town of gavi itself, so it's a, you know, decently small town, as you can see, Surround, surrounded by the, the um, you know, hills, but also 
the mountains, and these are basically the beginning of the, uh, the uh, Apennino Ligure or Ligurian Apennine Mountains. Very green, very luscious, very, very beautiful area, you know, worth visiting if you ever go to, to Italy or specifically to Piemonte. And also I want to show you just a quickly a picture of a, a bunch of Cortese, which is the grape. There you go. And this is the bunch of Cortese. As you can see, the berries have this nice green coloration uh, with this like puntinato or slightly dotted, you know, berries with some brown spots. That's Cortese right there. That's why when you look at the color of the wine, typically Gavi, anyway, young age Gavi is never gonna have this uh, very dark coloration. Maybe as it ages, it might gain a little bit more of a golden tone, but otherwise when they're young, they typically have this uh, nice, you know, hay straw color with some, you know, slightly greenish highlights, right? So now, from the territory of Gavi uh, that I showed you on the map, practically we were right here, Gavi, this is the southern Apennines, this is Liguria, we're moving to the area of Barbera d'Asti. So as you can see right here, says Barbera d'Asti, this is the town of Asti. So Asti is close to uh, Alba as well, but Alba, which is very well known for a variety of reasons for the white truffles, for Nutella, for those of you that love, love you know, the Nutella spread, that's uh, Alba is located in the Lange, which is the area where, again, Barolo, Barbaresco, the many beautiful Nebbiolo wines are produced, versus in the case of Asti, we are in the area known as Monferrato. So Monferrato is a territory where the, the reason why Typically, the Barbera d'Asti are considered to be superior to Barbera d'Alba, uh, but then again, that's a generalization, because you have to keep in mind, there might be a terrific producer of Barbera d'Alba, and there might be an okay producer of Barbera d'Asti, and vice versa. But overall, as a territory, Asti is considered to be the best for Barbera, because uh, you got to feel that in the territory of Monferrato, there's no production of Nebbiolo, right? Which is a very important grape that gives you high quality wines and it's a very well you know very much planted these days because people are willing to pay more money for it versus in the territory of Lange where Barbera d'Alba which would be the counterpart is planted you know there you find plenty of Nebbiolo so Barbera is a secondary grape although there are still some beautiful expressions but not to sidetrack onto that so in the area of Asti this is where this wine comes from this is called the Le Orme Le Orme means the footsteps or basically means the wine that from which the winery originated is the beginnings, right? Uh, because today, Michele Chiarlo, as I mentioned, is a producer that makes uh, many different uh, um, Barberas. Makes uh, Le Orme, which is kind of like their entry level, but a delicious, enjoy, deliciously enjoyable glass of wine. Makes uh, uh, I Cipressi di La Corte, which comes from the Nizza, area that used to be a subzone of Barbera d'Asti and today it's its own appellation which has very unique conditions it really gives some fantastic age-worthy more complex wines and then also makes a, a wine called La Corte which is the single vineyard expression from the Nizza territory. Now for this specific wine that we're going to be discussing at this moment uh, this is uh, basically 100% Barbera d'Asti but also as you can see right on the label says uh, 16 mesi or 16 months which tells you right there that this wine before being bottled actually has to be aged or it is aged for 16 months which is quite a bit of time considering you know the cost of a wine like this typically speaking but again for, for the Chiarlos you know Barbera has always been their world has been their beginnings is the place where they invested a lot they spent a lot of times and they worked really hard to elevate Barbera. So even at the entry level, they want to show that Barbera is a grape that has a fantastic potential, great quality, and can really over deliver. Uh, now, the name itself, Barbera, supposedly comes from the word barbaro in Italian, which means barbarian. The reason being because probably this was a territory that during Roman times, you know, during the BC times, and then eventually AD times, for, for a period of time was covered or was conquered by the by the, 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 the Gauls, right? So the barbarians, as the Romans called them. And the, and the Romans really had to fight very hard for a very long period of time to conquer these territories. That's why so many names of either places or grapes have the resonance B-A-R, like Barolo, Barbaresco, Barbera. And also because the name Barbaro refers to this very dark 
almost savage like color of the of the actual skin of the grapes which eventually translates into a very dark you know concentrated um, color of the wine itself so now typically barbera is a grape that is a it's a late ripener which means needs a fairly long extended uh, ripening season to be able to fully ripen to maturity because barbera I feel it's important ripening is fully complete because Barbera is a very high acidity as a grape. Um, there's pretty much very low tannins, so it's not a grape that's going to give you that mouth puckering drying sensation, which you would have with Nebbiolo on the opposite side of things. But also, as I mentioned, Barbera is fully charged of anthocyanins, which is basically the skin pigmentation. So it's very important that it fully ripens, so it gives you this very dark intensity of color, right? So ideally, Barbera likes to have a sunny south-facing exposures because that allows the grape, again, to be exposed more to the sun, more to the light, and ultimately these wines of great, you know, brightness and brilliancy. Uh, now, this wine itself, and similarly to the Gavi, after the grapes are harvested, usually Barbera will be harvested during between mid-September, third week of September. Now, that doesn't seem very late, although things have changed a lot because of in Piemonte, figure that in the Lange, which is the southern part of Piemonte, I'm not even talking about the north, like especially in a Biolo, usually used to be harvested all the way into the end of October, if not beginning of November, very, very late. We're talking about maybe 50, 60 years ago. Today, the harvest typically happens during the middle of September. So conditions have changed dramatically. The area got a lot warmer than it ever was. So for that reason, it's still a late ripener, but the late ripener doesn't mean the grapes are harvested like into October. But anyhow, so the grapes are harvested, brought to the winery, crushed, fermented in stainless steel tanks at room temperature. And then eventually this wine typically of the 16 months spends a few months in large casks that have been used multiple times for just kind of give a little bit more roundness, maybe just slightly more intensity on the mouth, and maybe, I don't want to say tannic structure, because again, Barbera, this level is not meant to be a tannic powerful wine, but just kind of round up the wine a little bit. And then eventually after 16 months, 16 months the wine is put into the bottle and released into the market, right? So fairly easy, pretty straightforward, nothing really complicated for this wine. So um, now hopefully you can see the color of the wine through the screen. You can see it's got a very dark tones. This is 2016, by the way. Um, now when I look at the color of the wine, the red is very, is very pink, right? which tells you about a wine that is still extremely youthful, but the core is very dark. It's a, it's a ruby dark, almost going a little bit into purple. So that tells you really about the power of color and the intensity of color specifically of this grape and the wines that this grape can make, right? So take a sniff. So now the wine, is, um, this Barbera is a plenty of the, you know, red and black fruit, a little bit of everything. But when I say black fruit, I mean more like a plum, you know, like a red plum quality. Definitely has a cherry tone, which is very, very pleasant on the nose. But then there's almost like a little bit also, not only the fruits, but also you have the undertones of like earthiness. It's almost like a slight side of a balsamic. I say balsamic, I mean by any means balsamic vinegar, but I refer to the almost like the slight menthol, minimal, but it's there, herbal, you know, menthol quality in the nose that makes the wine extremely refreshing on the nose. Maybe a little bit of a, uh, almost like a licorice, slight licorice root, which is very, very, you know, pleasant in my opinion, because the more aromas you have in a wine, the more complex eventually makes the bouquet of the wine. And I think it makes it really more enticing to enjoy, but before you drink, you actually smell it, which is really the beauty of the wine, right? On the palate, the wine is a, merely, you see the, the acidity in the middle of the palate in this case. The wine is a very vertical, as we say in, we would call in Italian, verticale, meaning wine that is a great vibrancy, very uplifted the acidity, leaves the palate nice and uh, dry. It's got good dehydration of the palate, almost like a touch of a sappy, salty quality, which really is a, is, is, is a characteristic that invites you to have some food. Barbera is probably considered to be, although Italy has so many grapes and so many great wines that really accompany very well the food and specifically the local food, Barbera, probably more than anything else, is considered to be one of the great food wines of Italy. Meaning at this level, anyhow, you could uh, have this wine with uh, 
a simple uh, antipasto, you know, the classic uh, salumi, a piece of cheese, maybe some, uh, you know, some other little things here and there. But also you can have this wine very easily with a pizza. I think this would be terrific if you just have it for me. I'm a Puritan, I like margarita, maybe margarita with mushroom, just to give a ton of earthiness. I think the wine can do very well, maybe just with some cheese, but also a beautiful pasta course, even a simple risotto, maybe not a very complicated risotto with a lot of things, but if you make a simple risotto even just with parmigiano, maybe like a little bit of smoked cheese, I think this wine can do very well because when you have something rich and more flavorful, I think, uh, you know, something that has a high acidity and great sensation of freshness on the palate that really helps, uh, you know, clean up the palate after you have a bite of, uh, of uh, something richer, right? And there is definitely also a little bit of dryness, not over the top as far as tannins, but uh, again, I think that oak, oak regiment, which is only minimal, we're talking about maybe three months here max in these larger casks, but definitely gives a sensation of dryness, a good salivation on the palate. I think this is really a glass of wine that anybody can enjoy, it doesn't matter what you prefer you know, to drink every day, but you know, I think it's really a wine that you can sip on, Maybe also coming this time of the year when conditions are warmer, for those of you that like maybe more white or rosé, there are certain wines of Italy like Barbera because it doesn't have, like I said, much tannins at all. You can slightly chill it. I don't mean cold, but just bring, put it in the fridge maybe 25 minutes before, you know, popping the bottle, before dinner, before whatever. And I think that will bring down the temperature a couple of degrees and really gives you a fantastic sensation of freshness, bring a little bit more floral notes out and make it ultimately, I think, a delicious wine to really accompany the cuisine for, for, for any type of night. If you're grilling, whatever you might be doing, if you have a pizza oven in your backyard, I think it would be terrific. So uh, now these are just uh, two of the main wines that Michele Chiavolo produces. Uh, hopefully we have a, a other opportunity to discuss more than this, because again, uh, other than Logic Chiarlo, which makes some fantastic wines, but beyond Chiarlo, for those of you that are fans of Italian wines, hopefully you've, you've tasted certain things, you're beyond Pinot Grigio, although sure Pinot Grigio is great, but as you probably know, Italy has a, right around 600 different registered grape varieties, which is really like the Pandora box. Once you open it, there's so much more fun to do and to taste and to discover. Uh, the main thing is like, don't be afraid of tasting something different and unique. And hopefully, most importantly tonight, uh, through these two wines, you were able to uh, at least learn something, but most importantly, discover a couple of wines uh, um, that you weren't familiar with. I definitely strongly suggest to taste them. Joey, I uh, thought mentioned something, but he has them at the store. And um, Joey, I don't know if you have anything to say. If anybody has any questions, I'm here. Um, and thank you for the attention. Yeah, that, that, that was great. Um, I really enjoyed it. And you know, you know so much. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, I, I know... Okay. I know a little bit of wine, wine too, and everything, but uh, but man, that that was really, really cool. A lot of fun, and uh, you know. Stop oh, I thought you, oh, I thought you were waving my waving my dog over here. No, 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 no. <laughs> I said I could talk. So, uh, but yeah, no. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Horizon, and and Adam, and everybody that helped you know make this happen. Thank you guys, Monsera. Um, Hopefully, we can do another. Uh, let me think. We have 600 grapes. We can do another 299 of these. Absolutely. Well, let's do it again. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Joe. Ciao, Todd. Thank you. Good to see you.